Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today, a place we can come that we call home with people that are all related to you because of a new birth. I thank you, Lord, for the assurance of our salvation that we were reminded of through communion, the work that you did on our behalf, the fact that we can add nothing to it. I pray that you'd be pleased with what we talk about here today, what we think about, the resolutions that we might make in our hearts to do about the things that we learn. I pray that you would bless all of this. It's so easy to have such a small thing like rain stop us from gathering. And yet, Lord, I pray that you might stir us up, that we might be fired up in the middle of a cold winter's day, that your spirit would burn like a fire in us, that you teach us new things, that you'd inspire us to greater lifestyle, that we might bring you glory and bring as many people as we can with us. So Lord, here we are. We give you ourselves in this time. We need you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're beginning a new book today. We're in the book of Mark. I have not yet gone through the book of Mark. And it's not because I'm afraid. (laughs) Maybe a little. The book of Mark, it's so refreshing to be able to go back into the Gospels and remember the foundational story of who Jesus is, what he did, what he said, how he behaved. All of that gives us wisdom to know how to live. Amen? Amen. And so we're going to go through the book of Mark. So as we look at it, I just want you to imagine the Jewish people at this time. Before Christ came, there was 400 silent years no prophet, no prophet of God from Malachi until we come to the book of Mark or Matthew, not a word. The God that brought Moses and the people of Israel through the Red Sea, the ones that brought him into the promised land, prophet after prophet spoke and speaking of the Messiah that would come and then 400 years of silence. That is the background that we walk into when we start the book of Mark. The the religion of the people of God had gotten to be a showplace where the Pharisees were more concerned with being recognized and respected and being in charge than they were in doing God's will. They were into the routine of doing all that the scriptures said and yet their heart was far from God. And for 400 silent years, God didn't speak to his people. And then, opens the book of Mark to the people of God. Like uh, going through a desert and finding a, a watering hole that you can actually drink from. God sends a prophet in the middle of all this, the last of the Old Testament prophets, who's John the Baptist, He comes to speak about the promised Messiah. The silence is finally broken. And it's broken initially with John the baptizer. So I just need you to understand the temperature of which we're walking into, into this timeline. People have felt like God is far away and he hasn't spoken to us. It seems like today, doesn't it? It feels like Everything going on in the world is happening so fast and it feels like God is so far away. And yet, we're this close to God pouring out a spirit and doing a new thing. He may be coming back at any moment. I feel those 400 years of silence. I feel that. And then it's like the light breaks and John the baptizer comes. So that's the book of Mark. The gospel according to Mark. I put that picture up there because people love animals. (laughs) No. 
Not at all. Every, every, one, of, every one of the Gospels is symbolized by a particular character. And um, it's interesting as you go to the book of Revelation, you'll see that there are creatures in heaven with four faces. One of them is a calf. I find that very interesting. Also, the, the, the tribes of Israel, when they gathered in the wilderness, they had four major standards that they stood by, and they each had a picture on it, just like the four faces in the book of Revelation. And just like that, you have the four Gospels, which are four points of view of the life of Jesus Christ. You get this wonderful microcosm of perspective when you have four writers writing the same story. They're all going to highlight things a little bit differently. And Mark is no different. Mark is going to portray Jesus as this suffering, sacrificial servant, like an ox, always working, always serving. So that's why the picture. The book of Mark is about Jesus and what he does. It's not about... His great sayings, it's not about the parables, it's not about, it's a book of action. It's a, it's a book that will make you tired when you read it. You get done and you're like, whew, like you just had a good workout. It's just a very busy book and as we go, you'll see this. It highlights the emotions and the limitations of Jesus and it shows what he does. It was one of the first of the four Gospels to be written around 50 to 65. And it was written by someone we know as John Mark. You might know his, his full name. Uh, they do that so that you might know who he is. It's written from Rome and it's confirmed by the early church fathers, the early writings, um, Justin the Martyr. Uh, many of them have affirmed that, yes, this was, this was John Mark, the one who was a disciple of Peter, the one who was... Uh, had a long history with the church. It's the shortest gospel of all of them, so it's 16 chapters. And it's covered in considerably less time, and you'll notice everything's kind of condensed. So you'll get these little vignettes as you go through. It's like, boom, two verses. And Matthew goes on for an entire chapter about the event. You'll, you'll get things like, today we'll talk about the temptation of Jesus Christ. It merely mentions he goes out into the wilderness and he's tempted of the devil, period. So you're kind of been given the headlines. These are just the facts, man, just the facts. And they're going to give you headlines as we go through. And so there's much more to the story behind it. And the other authors of scripture will actually add to it. But you're going to be given kind of these snapshots as you go through. It focuses on what Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all focus on different aspects of Jesus' personality. Like if you were to have four people here, that if you were to ask them and interview them about you, they would all have a different perspective, right? And they would all have a different comment. They'd all see something different. And I think that's uh, intentional. And I'm glad that we have four Gospels. Some people get confused. Mark is one of the synoptics, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptics, which means they're seeing the same. Uh, optics meaning to see and sin meaning in synthesis together. So you have these Gospels that are very similar. They're not exact. They're very similar. And it's intentional. It explains events... In Greek, Roman, and Latin jargon. So the intended audience, of course, would be Greek or Roman to the contemporaries of that time. For instance, the Jews, when they tell time, they tell you what hour it is. If it's the third hour, it's nine o'clock in the morning. That's how they measure time. Mark doesn't do that. When Mark measures time, he'll say it was the fourth watch or the first watch, and you go, what What watch? He's talking about a Roman way of keeping time, which is to divide the period up into fours. And so that's, all of these things, all of these little subtle things are gonna help you to understand where Mark's coming from, why he's conveying things the way that he is, and who his audience is. So it's easy to just put these things up on the, on the, you know, on the screen and say, this is, this is the deal with Mark, and you go like, okay. And you just believe me. But I want to tell you there are very good reasons why. You'll notice dimensions. 
are, are marked off differently than the Jews do. You're going to notice all of these things because John Mark is kind of got one foot in the Jewish world and he's got one foot in the Gentile world. And this is mostly targeted towards the Romans, towards the Gentiles. And you can almost feel this sort of uh, authoritarian fastness as he goes through. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are different in these ways. Matthew pretty much was to the Jews. He quotes more of the Old Testament than any of the other writers of the Gospels. So Matthew, who, if you remember, he was a, a tax collector, right? And he was a Jew. So he's writing things, and he's, his, one of his famous things is to say, Jesus fulfilled this. This is what was said of the prophets and was fulfilled by Jesus saying, and he quotes the Old Testament prolifically, more than any of the others, because he's seeing Jesus as the king of the Jews, as the lion of Judah, as the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Christ who would come. So that's how Matthew sees Jesus and the Gospels. Mark is written to a Roman audience because of all of the things that I aforementioned. And it talks about what Jesus did. You're going to notice words like now, and, and immediately. Immediately. Immediately? That, that sounds very panicky. It's a, it's a way of speaking, and it shows Jesus as an actor. He's acting. He's doing stuff. He's not sitting there. He's not passive. He's not a teacher. He's not a philosopher. He's doing things, and it's going to highlight him as a servant. And that's why I have the ox up there, because Jesus is like the servant, the ox, which is you know full of strength and is always steady and always there and always doing things. Mark paints Jesus as that. Luke written primarily to the Greeks, and so you're going to find a lot of philosophy there because the Greeks seek wisdom. And so what he's going to do is give them the wisdom of Jesus, and it's mostly about what Jesus said. It portrays him as the son of man, which is different, which is a focus on his humanity. If ever there is a good centurion in the story, or if ever there's a woman in the story, it's probably from the book of Luke, because the book of Luke is about women and centurions being good people. It's, it's an amazing thing. Uh, if you start to see these things, you'll begin to remember and know to where to look for these things. And it focuses more on his humanity as he appeals to the Greeks. And the book of John was really written for the church. All you have to do is read the beginning of it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's a heck of an opening line to a, a book about Jesus. And it, it, and it slaps people in the face and they say, I don't understand this. This, this isn't written to me. <laughs> and they'll put it aside if they're, if they're not believers and if they haven't studied. It's something that will completely put you off because it's a deep, deep book and it focuses on who Jesus was, his identity as the son of God, as God the son and his de deity. So that's the focus. And it's kind of a, a, it's from the heavenly point of view that you're able to see who Jesus is in the book of John. Does that all make sense? So that's, that's how the, the book stacks up against the others and why. John Mark is the guy who's writing this book, but the one who's dictating it to him is actually the apostle Peter. If you remember Peter, the guy who walked on water and sank. Peter who left the Lord and he said, I'll never leave you, Lord, everybody will leave you. And then he runs away. And he was the one that at a distance saw Jesus being in his trial and Jesus actually put his eyes on Peter and their eyes met and Peter ran out and he wept bitterly because he denied him three times. So Peter is a notorious quitter. In fact, it's said that the, the disciples periodically would go behind him and make the sound of a rooster crowing. Kind of a cruel joke. So Peter has this stigma that he's got to slough off and uh, he slips up a little in his ministry and Paul has to square him away. But Peter is the one who hooks up with John Mark. John Mark, being a young man, he's about 15 years younger than Jesus. And so he's probably a teenager when all of this is going on. So we have this non-disciple, 
some people are bothered that, Mark, well, Mark wasn't one of the original 12. Well, Matthew was, and John was, and we're good. Luke wasn't. He was a reporter. He went around and just, you know, he took down dictation. It's so good, because without, without Luke, what would we do with Christmas? You got the wise guys, you know, you got the shepherds, you got the angels, you got the birth, you got the star, you got all of that, all in the book of Luke, because Luke is taking it down. He's taking it like, a, like a, 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 somebody who's a, a journalist. But Mark is not a disciple, so he's kind of the second tier of disciples, but he's been around and he's been with them. He's a convert of the apostle Peter. If you go to chapter 5, verse 13 of, of Peter, 1 Peter, he calls Mark, John Mark, his son. And it's a common thing of what disciplers would do, and we see Paul does this with Timothy. He calls Timothy his son, even though it's not his physical son. It's his spiritual son, because he led him to Christ and took him out on ministry and that kind of thing. Peter calls John Mark his son in the faith. And so it seems that Mark, who also has a long-standing reputation of quitting, hooked up with Peter... And Peter disciples him. And that's why we have the book of Mark today. Because these two quitters, maybe you identify with them, connected and got together and they were both sharper for the better of, of both of them. The gospel according to Peter is really what the gospel of Mark is. Mark is the one who's taking down everything that's being said here. And there are some things in the book of Mark that you won't find when we get to them, when we get to the, the final chapter in chapter 16, we'll talk about that. But there are some things that you'll find. In fact, the very only instance of streaking is mentioned in the book of Mark. If you remember the night that Jesus was betrayed, he went to the garden with his disciples to pray in Gethsemane. And they all came to get him. They finally start taking Jesus away. And there's one person that follows the multitude of Romans taking Jesus away. And the Romans see him. And it's this young man, and he's wrapped in a linen cloth over his naked body, presumably sleeping in the garden, uh, taking off his outer garment, using it like a pillow, and just covering himself. And because of the quickness of how everything happened, just got up and was holding on to his bed sheet, and was basically naked following the Romans. The Romans turn around, grab the sheet, and the kid tries to get away, and he loses his sheet, and he runs away naked. The first instance of streakers. <laughs> and it's gone down through history that that was Mark himself, this young man that got busted in the garden. So, and it's interesting that it's only found in the book of Mark. It's not found in any of the other books. So... It's basically the gospel according to Peter. I already said Mark uh, is a teenager. Uh, in, in Mark 14, you can see some interesting things. He has a house, and he comes from a very well-off family because they entertained the church, and they were meeting there. If you remember in the book of Acts, Peter had gotten imprisoned. And when he was in prison, the house church, they were praying for him. That's John Mark's house and his mother. And they're all praying for Peter to be released. And suddenly there's a knock at the door and we're told Rhoda, who's the name of the, the girl who's the servant of the house, goes to the door while they're all in a prayer meeting and it's Peter. And she goes, oh, we were just praying for you to get released. And she slams the door in his face and runs back and says, hey, Peter's here. <laughs> and they say, no, couldn't be. Like great faith in these people at their prayer meeting. No, it couldn't have been. It must have been his angel. What, a look-alike? You've got a doppelganger angel, really? <laughs> so somebody gets up from the prayer meeting and goes to the front door, and sure enough, it's Peter standing at the door. He's been released. They can stop praying for him. And he explains everything that's going on, and he leaves. That's John Mark's house. That's John Mark's mother. And so we're, we're told that He's been very, very much part of what the disciples are doing. So he has an inside track, but it's really not his gospel. It's really Peter's gospel as he's writing it. He accompanied Paul on his first missionary journey with Barnabas. And if you remember, Paul went out, and as he went out, they started preaching. John Mark was with them. John Mark says, I, I, I want to go home. And they're like, all right, well, you can go home, but we're not going with you. 
So they continue on with their missionary journey, both Barnabas and Paul. And this is Barnabas. Barnabas is his cousin, by the way. And so they get done with their missionary journey. They come back and they tell everybody at Antioch, this is what happened. We saw Gentiles get saved and, you know, all sorts of, you know, casting out demons and there were all sorts of miracles. And, and then Paul says, I got an idea. Why don't we go back and we'll visit the churches that we once saw? And uh, Barnabas says, that's great. I'll go get John Mark. And Paul said, no, you won't. And he says, well, we, we got to bring John Mark. He was with us the first time. He goes, yeah, but I, I, I can imagine this in my mind, by the way. I, I, I'm not going to bring him. He's a quitter. He quit on us. We got halfway out there, and he just, I, I don't want somebody that's going to drop the ball, so uh, we're not taking him. And Barnabas, I can imagine saying, where's your compassion, bro? Where's your forgiveness? Can't you have grace on this guy? I mean, he's my cousin. You know how it is when somebody's in your family. Come on, cut him some slack. He's my cousin, you know. A little nepotism happening there. But it's not something that Paul is willing to yield on. And it says they had no small argument. When the Bible says they had no small argument, that means they had a big argument. They had a big argument about this, and neither one would bend these two godly men who have been out on these missionary journeys. And so Paul picks Silas, and he goes back, and Barnabas grabs John Mark, and he goes to Cyprus, which is where they went initially. Well, from what we understand through the history, he gets sent back to Jerusalem, and he gets discipled by Peter, another famous quitter. And how God uses those experiences. Isn't it great how nothing in our life is wasted? Jesus uses all of it. And so Peter disciples him. Paul goes on his missionary journey, and instead of one couple, now you have two couples that are missionaries. So God worked it together for good, so I can't find that either one of those men was wrong in what they did. And the early church met at his house, and I mentioned that's out in Acts 12, if you want to look that up. So we have lots of information about Mark, who's, who's the uh, penned author here, and about how he was discipled by Peter. So as we go through, we'll just keep those things in mind. All right, verse one. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. If you look at the other Gospels, they have very long beginnings. Matthew is going to give a very long genealogy of who Jesus is related to, right? You're going to see, in the book of Luke, you're going to see another long genealogy of who Jesus is related to, one through his father, one through his mother, one his legal and one his physical uh, descendancy. And then you're going to see John, who... In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's, that's his origin. And because he's concerned about his image of who he is, he doesn't give his earthly descent because it doesn't matter. He's the Son of God. And yet Luke does and Matthew does. Matthew, for his legal right to be a Jew and to be the Savior from the descendancy of David and also from his mother. So you get these very long introductions justifying who Jesus is Mark just says, in the beginning, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, period. So you get the flavor of how he's going to write from now on. And then this is the only time that the author quotes the Old Testament. The only time the Old Testament is brought up in these two instances right here in the beginning. All the others are Jesus quoting the Old Testament. Guess what Jesus' favorite book was? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Jesus' favorite book was Deuteronomy. At least he quotes from Deuteronomy more than all the others. But this is the only time you're going to see the author explain using an Old Testament passage because the Jews are not his primary audience. Behold, I send a messenger before your face who will prepare your way for you. There's no genealogy because Jesus is seen as the suffering servant. You don't need a descendancy, right? You don't need to say, well, I was on the Mayflower. You know, you don't have to have any of that kind of credential because he's a servant. A servant has no credential, right? So the two passages that you see here are from Isaiah 40, verse 3, which all of the gospel writers quote, and Malachi 3, 1, which is quoted here by Mark. Preparing the road. <laughs> 
basically, John the Baptist is the one who's going to come and prepare the road, right? This is the big wind-up to introduce John the Baptist. Uh, by the way, he wasn't Baptist. He wasn't Lutheran. He wasn't Methodist. He wasn't even Baptist. He was a baptizer, really. So if you want to be particular, you can call him John the Baptizer. But John the Baptist, interesting character. He's there to prepare the road. In other words, he's, when, when you would have a dignitary or a king that would come into town, they would have people that would go in advance and they would make sure there's no homeless shelters on the side of the road. There'd be no potholes in the road. They'd fill it in. They would make sure that it would be all prepared. Uh, if you remember when President Obama came to Edison, New Jersey uh, during his tenure, they peppered the entire neighborhood with uh, uh, agents with like automatic rifles on their shoulders. And he went to this famous sub shop in Edison and you can see guys on the roof with rifles <laughs> protecting his visit to go get a sub. You know, they used to do this a long time ago, but it was more preparing the road and making sure it was safe as it went. And that's who John the Baptist was. He's somebody who came to kind of prepare people's hearts to meet with the Lord. You know, that's kind of what our worship team does, doesn't it? Kind of prepares us and focuses us and gets our eyes on the Lord so we can hear from the Holy Spirit. So it's about preparing the road, about moving, moving things forward and getting ready for the Messiah who would come. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And then all the land of Judea and those in Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. We're given this very short vignette. And of course, we know John the Baptist was born and he's the cousin of Jesus or the half cousin of Jesus. We know about Elizabeth and we know all of that through whom? Luke. Whenever there's a woman involved, it's probably the book of Luke. We know about Elizabeth's song and Mary's song, and all of that comes from the book of Luke. So Elizabeth gives birth to him, and he actually has the Spirit of God upon him from birth. Interesting. I don't know anybody else that that's described of. But John the Baptist has the Spirit, and he recognizes Jesus in the womb of Mary when Mary shows up. He, he does like a soccer kick or something inside his mother's belly when Jesus shows up in, in utero. And we're given all of that from the book of Luke here. We're given it very, very short that he just appears. Here's this guy. And he, he was something to look at too because he, he had a Nazarite vow. A Nazarite vow from birth means I don't cut my hair, any of it. No manscaping. <laughs> Can you imagine? You know, sometimes when I feel my beard's getting out of control, I think about John the Baptist and I say, ah, I got a long way to go. My wife says, you know, you really need a haircut. And I go, ah, I got a long way to go. John the Baptist was out there, man. And he baptized people out in the Jordan River for the remission of sins. And he's baptizing Jews. You know, Jews don't get baptized. If you were a Gentile and you wanted to become a Jew, you had to learn the law. You had to get, you got to nip the tip. You got to get circumcised. And you have to wash you have to get baptized. And it's interesting, you'd baptize yourself. It's like they didn't want to touch you. They didn't want to put their hands on you. you go, go take a bath. Go get cleaned up. And so baptism was something that they did. And baptize is a word that you'll actually find into the Old Testament, but it was done of cloth. When you take cloth and it's like a nice white cloth and you put it in purple dye and it comes out purple, that is the kind of baptism that they were most using. It's interesting when you, when you soak into the blood of Jesus how that changes us, right? And yet it's not a baptism uh, of water, it's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he changes our lives. So this baptism is for the remission of sins. And yet we know the Old Testament says there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So John the Baptist is starting something new here. Guys, you can come and confess your sins and it says they'll be remitted or they'll be covered over if you have a sincere intention to do God's will. I find that to be kind of unbiblical. And you know, the Pharisees saw this happening and thought it was heresy. 
Because they gotta, they got to come to us, man. They, they can't go to you and get their sins forgiven. And forget, they can't go straight to God either. That's crazy. This is kind of a step of faith for somebody to do this. But the Jews were coming. Lines after lines of people coming to be baptized, confessing their sin. And you see, he's preparing the heart for Jesus to show up. These are people who would one day find Jesus and follow him. These are people who have already done business with God and realized they're a sinner. Like Romans you know, 6.23, that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this is a baptism of repentance, which is an expression of faith, which I think is rather interesting. Where is he baptizing? In the Jordan River. Why? Because there's water there. If you're going to baptize people, it's a good idea to have water, don't you think? Just agree with me, please. Yeah. And the place where he's baptizing, it doesn't say here, but it's the place where the Jews crossed over Jordan into the promised land. And if you remember, they set up a whole stack of stones in the middle of the river because the Lord split it for them and they were able to walk over as soon as the Levites got in the water. That's where he's chosen to baptize. I think that's rather significant. And it's, it's significant because we're given the story later of exactly where this is. And of course, like everything in the Holy Land, it's made into be a big deal. You can go and get baptized actually in the Jordan River in the very place where John the baptizer baptized Jesus. And some people think that's cool enough to spend, you know, $5,000. So we got a pool. We'll put it right out here. We'll get you wet. But this is it, actually. This is the location. So if you go there, uh, don't be surprised. It's just kind of a greenish-brown, muddy river. It's the crossing of where they went into the promised land. In verse 6, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Perhaps you're having that for lunch. And he preached saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And so we're given this very quick, fast-paced story about baptizing in the Jordan. And what does this guy look like? He looks like Hagrid, right? You guys know, yeah. Ruby is Hagrid? Nobody knows Ruby is Hagrid. Wow, okay, we, got, we have an aging population here. He's, he's a big hairy dude out in the wilderness and he's wearing camels. By the way, you, if you know anything about camel, camel was not kosher. So he's wearing a non-kosher, you know, non-cool with, with the religious Jews because he's wearing camel, which is a bit of an atrocity. And he has a leather belt around his waist. Well, why do we care whether he has leather or it's vinyl or like, who cares? Because the description of him is exactly the description of Elisha. Elijah, rather. Elijah came, it was a prophet, and he looked a lot like Elijah, which is why the Pharisees came up and said, are you Elijah? Because he looked like Elijah, and the description of him was just like the description of John. He took this Nazarite vow, so I picture him to be this big, hairy biker dude, you know, kind of rough with his speech. In fact, his mouth got him into trouble because he told the truth, right? He, got, he, he would get in your face if you were in the wrong. And he would tell you about it. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it in a sweet fashion, I imagine. He would say, repent. So in 2 Kings, you can find that uh, allusion to him. And so he's baptizing, and all of a sudden, in the midst of John just doing what God's told him to do, to go out and prepare for the Messiah, here he comes, up over the hill coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. Now, John the baptizer was baptizing for the remission of sins, and yet Jesus had no sin. So why did Jesus get baptized? To fulfill the law, although there is no law about baptism. It's interesting. Jesus came to be an example. The same reason God rested on the seventh day. You think he was tired? Nah. Nah. He rested on the seventh day from all the creating that he was doing because he just, he reached an end. And he set an example for us 
By the way, working seven days a week, not good for you. Maybe you know this by experience. And immediately, there's, there's one of our words. Coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. It's like, wow, there's an entire Sunday sermon right there on one, on one slide. Jesus goes into the water and it's interesting. You see the father shows up because there's a voice. We see Jesus being baptized and we see the spirit like a dove falling upon him. You, do you believe in a trinity? Well, it's interesting. It's right here in the book of Mark. If, if you want to show that to some of your Jehovah Witness friends. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, they even have some uh, branches of Christianity uh, like the oneness people, uh, Pentecostal oneness. They don't believe that God will ever take uh, three forms. It will, he'll only appear in one form or another. So while Jesus is here, the Holy Spirit can't come. But Jesus is here, the Spirit's here, and the Father's here, right? So there's a trinity, and God's the one who sets the rules, not us, by the way. And so he descends upon him like a dove. So this is kind of his initiation. His anointing is not from any of the priests. You would have to anoint a priest before he would start his ministry, and you would put oil on his head and all of that. And this is Jesus' anointing, if you will, because this is the beginning of his ministry. He's probably 30 years old at this point in time, which is usually the time that somebody would enter the priesthood if they were a Levite. So Jesus is being anointed to be our high priest. And so a voice comes from heaven, you're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah, Jesus didn't have to repent of any sins. He was there as an example. And immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, who was in with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. It's interesting. Do you ever remember that there were wild beasts? It says it here in the book of Mark, which is whenever there's a difference from Mark from the other gospels, I find it interesting. And it says the angels came and ministered to him. There's another time when this happened, when he was in the garden, remember? The angels ministered to him. There was another time when he was up on the Mount of Transfiguration and he had, he had a little bit of a, a war council up on the mountain. But... He was out there with the wild beasts. Now, we know from the other gospels that he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, and then the 40th day, he was hungry. They say when you go that far, uh, I'm, I mean, I know what it's like to fast to the point where you're not hungry anymore, but they say when your body gets hungry around that 40th day, that's your body saying, if you don't feed us, we're going to die. And so Jesus was hungry, and that's when the devil came and tempted him. You ever get tempted when you're hungry? Only a couple of you, okay. Yeah, I try to make sure I eat frequently. So I, I'm not tempted. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. So the, the whole temptation of Jesus and the three temptations that the devil brought to him uh, are not listed here, but it's just Jesus was the same spirit that fell upon him, com made him and compelled him to go out into the wilderness. And this was his testing period. Before he entered full-time ministry, guess what happened? He was tested. And you may find that to be the case with you. Before you reach that place of fullness and peace or whatever it is that you think God has called you to, there might be a whole lot of testing between now and then. I can attest to it myself. I had a whole lot of testing between then and now. And Jesus did as well. Verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison... By the way, this is like a big fast forward into something that happens later. After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand and believe the gospel. So Jesus began preaching at this point in time after, Jesus, after uh, John gets put in prison. John gets put in prison because he, he, he tells... Uh, he tells somebody something he didn't want to hear. 
and they eventually cut his head off, right? It was a time in which he began to doubt if Jesus was the one whom he said he was. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. And he sends a couple of disciples. And he says, ask him, if, are you the guy or are we looking for somebody else? Because John is languishing in prison. And he's wondering, are you really the Messiah? Because you should be setting the prisoners free, according to the scriptures. And hello. You see, he was looking for justice. And he didn't see it happen. And so he began to question in his faith. You guys know what that feels like? You get in a place where you're suffering unjustly. And you say, Lord, where are you? We all get tested like that. All of us. And it's a good thing. Because we come out on the other side like gold. Verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Well, that makes sense. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. So we see the calling of Simon, who becomes Peter, and Andrew, who were fishermen. We see James and John, who were their neighbors, also fishing. So Jesus begins calling his disciples after himself. We don't see all of the drama behind where Jesus shows up and says, hey, uh, Peter, why don't you put the boat out? And Peter says, well, listen, I've been fishing all day. I haven't caught anything. But at your word, I'll do it. And so he pushes off and he goes out. And Peter's fishing over the one side of the boat, which you typically fish off. And he says, why don't you throw the net on the other side? And Peter's like, all right, this seems like a stupid thing. I mean, you, you should stick to Bible teaching, pal. You know, I'm the, I'm the fisherman, but I'll do it. And so he does it. And there's so many fish, he doesn't know what to do. And he has to call James and John over. And they help them to haul all these fish back in. And Peter drops to his knees and he says, Lord, you got you to gotta stay away from me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I, I, I might, you know, the F-bomb might go shooting off out of my mouth at any moment. You don't want me. And Jesus smiles at him and he says, you know, you're going to be a fisher of men. That's what you're going to be. And I, I just think about how Jesus begins picking his team. You know, we used to play kickball in, in, you know, uh, when I was very young. And, you know, you'd pick teams. You get two captains. Usually they were the, the more athletic of, of the bunch. And, and, you know, I pick you and I pick you and I pick you and I pick you. And then there's always the last kid, you know. That's like, no, you could have him. No, 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 you could have him. And I feel like that's where Jesus went first. Started with Peter, who ends up being a lot of maintenance for Jesus, if you think about it, right? And James and John, these sons of thunder, they were named, given, given biker names. We do that at men's breakfast. We give everybody bikers. We got, we got stiff neck Dave, or, or their mafia names sometimes. But he picks what you and I would not pick. He picks people not of extreme faith or extreme anything. He picks what you and I might say, you, you don't want that guy on your team. He'll never kick the ball. And yet we see the Holy Spirit coming upon them and the church. How many Christians are there in the face of the planet now? And it started with these 12 knuckleheads. And now there are so many more knuckleheads. And so he sees these guys and he calls them and he calls the brothers over. We're not given all of the backstory and the time that they had met previous to this because they just dropped their nets and they went, leaving us a great example of what to do. When the Lord tells you to do something and he calls you, do it. Amen. Immediately. Notice there's, there's over 1,337 references to immediately, now, and it's just a constant action, all of these little vignettes as we go. And I'll, I'll do my best to share some of the background, which you probably already know. But the point of this is, these guys following Jesus went, and immediately 
They dropped it all. He left his father. He left the hired hands in the boat. And they, their whole life had changed because they met Jesus. Have you met Jesus and your whole life changed? He does the same today. Then they went into Capernaum. By the way, that's Peter's hometown. And immediately, you see these words, right? Immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, calls James and John, and immediately says, let's go to church. Can I get cleaned up? No, you're good. Let's go. Immediately. <laughs> Jesus came up, tapped him on his shoulder, so let's go. Where are we going? Church. Oh, <laughs> I haven't been there in a while. <laughs> and they go to synagogue. They go to the place of meeting. And Jesus teaches. Isn't that interesting? What they would do is the way that you were dressed, if you were a teacher, if you were a rabbi, you would dress a certain way. And people would notice that and they'd say, oh, we have a rabbi in the audience. Would you like to come up and say something? And they would come up and they would open the scroll. They would open the book of Isaiah or whatever and they would read the scriptures and they would teach from the podium. Uh, we're not going to do that. Just figure out, let you know. I'm not going to just pick anybody who happens to be dressed in a suit and come up here and talk. But this is what they did. And so now Peter and Andrew and James and John are going to sit through a church service and say hello to their neighbors who they haven't seen maybe for a while and listen to Jesus teach. And they get to know him that way. People, we get to know Jesus that way too, right? Through the preaching of his word, the reading of his word, through the prayers as we're on our knees, through serving him and doing those things God's gifted and called us to do. We get to know the Lord better that way. And it's interesting that they took note of his authority. Now, when Mark is teaching this to a Roman crowd, you can imagine how that was an interesting fact. Jesus had authority. Authority is one of those attractive things to a relativistic world. You know, a relativistic world is, well, there's really no good or evil. Okay, well, what about stealing? Well, it depends. Okay, so, so give me your wallet. How's that feel? Give me the keys to your car. How's that? How's that feel? You and your relativistic theology. There's no such thing as good and bad. Oh, yeah? Well, you wouldn't mind if I put you in a headlock and choked you out until you were, you know, limp on the ground. That'd be okay? Well, as long as you don't hurt anybody. Okay, well, everything hurts everybody. You know, so you could go on and on and on and have arguments with imbeciles all day long. But a relativistic world where... Truth isn't really truth. It's only your truth or my truth. And that gets all watered down. And you know what? People, the average person who has a soul that's hungry for God isn't going to live off that stuff. You know, I could learn to tap dance and do fancy things up here and, you know, do a backflip and I could entertain you and you could all go, oh, that's fabulous. An old man like him can do that. You know, <laughs> that could all be good, but that, you're not, your soul is not going to be fortified by entertainment which tells me these people are starving for a word from God. Right. And Jesus comes and he speaks and they're like, right on. Amen. There's something in my soul that resonates when I hear the truth of God, when I hear somebody else quote a scripture or bring something to bear, a good counsel or a good piece of wisdom. Boy, it's something that resonates in the soul, doesn't it? And they got to hear, gee, can you imagine having heard Jesus teach? Just his facial expressions and everything. I, 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 I wish I saw him. I, I wish I saw him with my own eyes. And yet, these guys got to see him in the very beginning of his ministry, in the very beginning of them following him. And he speaks with authority. When you speak the word of God, you speak with authority. When you tell people Jesus Christ is the son of God, you can do that, by the way, because it's the truth. And when you say it, convinced and with authority. There's someone behind that, the Holy Spirit of God, which will bring conviction. Authority is knowledge and conviction together. It's a knowledge of something, but not just a knowledge. There's a deep conviction. There's a settled 
fire of, I know this is true. And that's the authority that Jesus just exuded. And so Mark sees the authority of Jesus as being this very attractive quality. Um, I'm going to talk to the men for a minute. You know, for us men to take up leadership positions in this world, and especially if your skin is the same color as mine, it's seen as an evil thing. Oh, that's so masculine, it's so aggressive. Well, who's going to take charge? I'll tell you what. Men, God has called us to be leaders, like Jesus, as we serve, as we serve and love those who are around us. It's not about taking authority. It's about being faithful with authority. We have had so many unrighteous men in this world take authority and misuse it to squeeze other people for money or to subjugate other people. And that makes people with my skin color look terrible, which makes me look terrible in the eyes of this world. I want to be like Jesus and live that down. How about you? Authority is knowledge and conviction. John chapter 3, it's said of Jesus, for he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. And God does not give the spirit by measure or without limit. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Jesus was the only one that was given the Spirit without measure. Every one of us has a measure. You know, we're like a cup. You know, some of us are little cups. Some of us are bigger cups. Some of us are, you know, giant cups. Jesus was a bottomless cup. He was given the spirit without measure. Boy, I really wish I would have seen him when he walked the earth. I wish I could have been there. And yet God holds us responsible to be faithful with the little cup he's given us, right? And it's so easy to just neglect and to put it away. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. That's great. There's always one, right? Sometime in your life, you're going to have somebody in church that just is full of an unclean spirit. Uh, you, you guys are wondering who it is, right? It's like getting on a plane and looking for the terrorist. I did a lot of flying at that time what I did. But there's this, Jesus calls these guys, he's baptized, he gets John and, and his brother James, and he gets Peter and Andrew, let's go, to, let's go to church. They go to church, Jesus is speaking, and there's one person there with an unclean spirit. So there's going to be conflict. Right away in Jesus' ministry, there's conflict. Do you know, anytime you want to do something good, you know there's an enemy of our souls? And he'll be right there to try to steal it away. And that's okay. Because Jesus handles it. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? It's interesting. They know who he is immediately. Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It's funny. This spirit knew before anybody else in the room who Jesus was. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And then the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice. He came out of him. Then they were all amazed. And so they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. You see, they were impressed again by his authority. And it's emphasized again. So you've got one person that's got an unclean spirit and they rise up in the middle of Jesus, presumably speaking the word of God. And Jesus handles it. He didn't call the deacons. Aren't you glad, guys? John Graham, would you take care of this unclean spirited guy over here? Grab him him by the neck, drag him out of here. (laughs) 
I'm in the middle of speaking God's word. I have no problem. <laughs> I'll be glad to take care of it, John. I'll use the scripture as my example. Um, Jesus handled it with authority. And he cast out this evil spirit. And it was multiples. Why do you come to bother us? It's multiple. It's not just one. And Jesus cast them out. And the guy convulses on the ground. And then he's in his right mind and he's back. His family gets him back because this evil spirits are, are now gone. The ministry of Jesus is such that he casts out demons and evil spirits. You got some of those in your past? Jesus cleans house. Jesus will clean your house. Because putting up with things like that aren't necessarily bad things. Because by the time it was all over, they recognized Jesus for who he was. A true and right message from a contaminated instrument is not worth enduring. Jesus shut these spirits down because they were speaking the truth, but they were very bad advertising, right? It's uh, like people should be very careful who they pick to be spokesmen for their commercials, you know, because if you get some famous athlete that says, yeah, you could buy this shoe and you can go faster and jump higher and, and all that, and then they're found guilty of a crime or, you know, some heinous thing, nobody will buy that shoe because it's got a bad spokesperson. That's why Jesus shut them down. Not because they weren't telling the truth, but because they weren't worthy to say it. Never legitimize a false ministry. You know, I know, I know people like to go online, you know, and, and they like to argue the Bible with people. Oh, yeah, but it says here in the Bible. Take that, enter. <laughs> and then they'll come back with something. And be like, ooh, oh, I felt that one. Okay, wait, let's pull up another one. Pastor Dave, I'm talking to somebody online and having an argument, and I'm trying to prove, you know, you know, God doesn't need you to fight him for, you know, fight for him. He's okay. He, he can take care of it and he can melt a heart just like that. When years and years and years of you arguing didn't do anything, one moment with the Holy Spirit falling on them, they'll be in tears. Amen. So you should pray for them. So don't legitimize somebody's false ministry. If somebody got a false ministry and they say, yeah, I think we all came from apes. and we're, uh, Okay, I'll see you at the judgment seat. Enter. What do you mean? Now they're asking you questions. <laughs> I believe we're going to stand before God for everything done in the body because the Bible says so. Jesus came, lived a perfect life, and he resurrected from the dead and told us that he's preparing a place for us. So I'm with him. Good luck. I'm not going to sit and go back and forth and try to argue with people. You want to, you want to argue with people? You want to sharpen? <laughs> You want to sharpen your knife on somebody? You go right ahead. Enjoy yourself. Good luck with that kind of ministry because the Holy Spirit does a better job. So he's chosen some guys. They've gone to synagogue. Jesus teaches. There's an evil spirit that gets cast out. And immediately his fame spread through all the region around Galilee. And as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. They're going for lunch, which is what we do. And James and John. But Simon's mother, Simon's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, lay sick with a fever. And they told him about her at once. Notice the at once. And so he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her. And she served them. They had a great day at synagogue. Jesus taught, cast out a demon. Hey, where are we going? Oh, we're coming to my house for lunch, Peter says. Okay, let's go. He gets there and his mother-in-law's sick. Guess who's serving lunch? The mother-in-law. Just disaster after disaster in this story, Pastor. I'm so glad my life doesn't have obstacles like that. Jesus goes over to his mother-in-law. By the way, Peter is supposed to be the first pope and he's married. To have a mother-in-law, you have to have a wife, right? That's true. That's true. I'm just letting you know. Small observance. 
So Peter's mother-in-law is not well, and she's the, she's the one who's been supposedly making, making lunch, right? Imagine, I show up with four friends at home. Hi, honey, I'm home. How was your time? Oh, who are these people? Oh, we've all come here to crash for lunch. Oh, you could have called. <laughs> and so Jesus is going with all of these guys for lunch over at Peter's house, but his mother-in-law's sick. So what's Jesus do? Ah, it's all right. We'll go to McDonald's. <laughs> no, Jesus, in true form, as a servant, goes and he lifts her up. First of all, he reaches out and touches a sick woman. I don't know about that. He reaches out and touches a sick woman, and just his touch changes her, and she gets on her feet. And the first thing she does, starts making lunch. When Jesus touches you, the first thing you're going to want to do is serve him. When Jesus touches your life and he makes you new, and you knew that you had a sin-sick soul, and Jesus makes you new, the first thing you're going to want to do is serve him. It's a natural, right response to what Jesus did. Well, guys, we're going to leave it right there because the time has moved forward and I'm not done with the whole first chapter. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I knew this was going to happen. It happens all the time when we have communion. and I'm starting a book and there's an intro. It's okay. Jesus, Jesus was a person of action. He's a person that saw needs and because he was ready and filled with the spirit, he was able to take care of those needs, whatever they were. An evil spirit, calling of disciples, praying when no one else was around, Jesus was always drinking in that relationship with his father so that he might serve other people. I would hope that your heart would be the same way today.